I really want to do this all over again, but more professional. Hello everyone, and welcome to this episode of Moth Cycles. My video series where I show the entire life cycle of a certain moth species. And in this video, I'm going to show you how to read these guys. Anterea polyphemus, a silk moth from North America called the polyphemus moth. I am working behind the scenes on several videos of this type. They are called moth cycles. And Moth Cycles is the name of my special video project where I show you the life cycle of a moth species from egg to adult and the way I raise them in captivity. Hi there everybody, it's your favorite online entomologist again, Bart Coppens. And here I am holding a tube with eggs of a moth from the Far East, from Russia. It is called the Dolbina Tankrai. I really want to do this all over again, but more professional. I understand that you could be confused right now because when I'm going to show you a life cycle you probably imagine me filming the eggs, the caterpillars, the cocoons and then the moths and that's exactly what I'm going to do it just so happens that I was already breeding this species and the moths that you see right now is my bloodline from Canada that I was breeding uh, over several generations already and these moths did something naughty they paired that means that the females of this bloodline were going to lay many, many fertile eggs for me. So in fact, this is where the life cycle begins. Not with eggs that I ordered online, but by moths making love and laying a lot of fertile eggs for me. So it's true, the moths that you're looking at right now are the same individuals that are going to make babies and lay many eggs for me, for which I will use to start this episode. This life cycle starts in the very cage where I keep them. Because as you can see the sides here are full with eggs. These small black things here that you see on the side of the cage. That's right, they're all eggs. It's very easy to take them from the sides. And these eggs are fertile. The males and females have paired with each other which means that in two weeks these little eggs will hatch into caterpillars and I will show you the life cycle of this beautiful insect. So 
So I'm going to start by removing some of the eggs here from this cage and putting them inside my little container here. Just collecting all the eggs carefully. It's okay to uh, take them with your fingernails. These eggs have a thick shell, they're very strong. So it's okay to harvest them with your hands. Now this is the first day of harvest that you see here. As you can see I already have hundreds of eggs, but uh, this is still nothing because um, these females will continue laying eggs this week. So that means I will have hundreds and hundreds of eggs. In fact, I have more than I can raise myself. So that means I will also be trading some of them and selling some of them to my close friends. Oh, by the way, maybe to do a little bit of advertisement here, but consider um, crowdfunding me and joining my crowdfunding platform Patreon. Why am I saying this? Because one of the benefits, uh, one of the rewards I give people uh, who help crowdfund my channel is I put them on top of the list for eggs of cocoons of my own breeding. Um, that is if you live in the Europe or the United States. Why? Because I have to abide by the law. And uh, I'm a very well-known person that works with insects. And it may be illegal to send them to other countries than this. Either way, the polyphemus moth is very easy to breed. These uh, eggs are going to hatch in two weeks time. So we're going just to keep them warm or room temperature and this is a very easy life stage. Now the caterpillars will love to eat willow, salix or birch, betula. They're really, one of their favorites is oak tree, quercus. Um, but they also eat many types of cherry, prunus and more. So we're going to keep them, wait until they hatch and then I'm going to film my progress. All right, so the first thing that I want to do is uh, put them in a better container because this one uh, is too small and kind of crappy. There you go. Now this container here should be sufficient. So what I'm going to do now is nothing. I'm going to wait for two weeks. They don't need any spraying. They do not need any heat, they do not need special care, they need nothing. Just wait, put them on room temperature and they will be fine. Okay, so at this point, two weeks have passed. You're not going to see it in the video, because waiting for two weeks is boring and not very nice content to show. But after a while, I opened the container and guess what it is that I saw? My God, what have I done? You see these little things here on the sides? They are all little caterpillars hatching in mass amounts. As I said, I was clearly going to be successful with this. Here we have our first babies of Polyphemus moth. Hundreds and hundreds of babies Hatching from their eggs Now for the next important step We are going to need a few things the First of them is an empty plastic container Any type of container goes there do not have to be ventilation holes. That's not very important that's a common misconception. Caterpillars use very little oxygen and are not very likely to suffocate. But they do need a space where they cannot escape from all the little caterpillars. So get yourself a nice plastic box that can lock. That's the first. The second thing is a paper towel. This is optional and not obligatory if you want to breed them. But it's quite useful. The paper towel will help keep the container easy to clean and absorb excess moisture. But no panic if you don't have one. It's just something that helps perform them better. Third thing you will need is a stick. Not a sharp one with a blunt end. 
is because we are going to place the caterpillars from their hatching container into this one. And these very small caterpillars are so fragile that if you use your fingers, you are likely to crush them or cause them damage. So we need something very small and light to scoop up the caterpillars with and transfer them into this container here. Um, actually the best thing to use is a paintbrush. If you have one, use a paintbrush or maybe a fiber or a hair. Try to be creative. Stick is also acceptable if you're really careful. Although don't use sharp ends, this is not good. If, you, if I use this, I will stab them to death. I must use the blunt end. And last but not least, we need food. There has to be something for them to eat inside the container. Now, my number one choice is birch tree, picked from my own garden, fresh and tasty. However, if you're watching this video and you want to breed the polyphemus moth, fear not, you don't need birch. The moth is actually quite polyphagous. Um, that's a fancy term for the fact it will eat many things. Um, unlike other butterflies and moths, these moths do not specialize on one single plant. They are very open-minded and they will love to eat a big variety of plants. Not all plants, okay? They have to be from the following list. They like willow, aka salix. It's a good food plant for them. They also in particularly like oak tree, aka Quercus. If you have oak tree or willow, they will love eating that. I think another option is sweet gum, aka liquid amber. Although I am not entirely sure about this, I have a good suspicion they will like to eat it. And they will also like to eat several types of cherry, aka prunus. But not all kinds, they like the, the, the decuous ones, that means the ones that lose their leaf in winter. They do not like the thick um, prunus uh, uh, laurel cerasus, for example. Laurel cherry has very thick waxy leaf, but other types of, types of prunus are fine. Before the caterpillars go in, I prepare the container. Remove the lid. Take some of my paper towel. Spread it on the bottom of the container. Now the caterpillars can poop a lot and when they poop they will now poop on the paper and not in the container. This makes it easily easier to clean. Last but not least they are delicious, delicious tasty birch tree. And the container is ready to contain many caterpillars. Now I'm going to put hundreds of caterpillars inside this single container here. And it's actually not recommended to have so many in one box. But um, for now this is okay uh, because I'm not going to keep them in here for long. I'm just going to get them started on the food and when they have started eating I will immediately place them uh, well in a, a better container. You'll see what it is. Okay let's not get ahead of the video for too far. By the gods there are so many where do I even start? You look like a nice caterpillar. Ah, as you can see, he's on my stick now. There you go, little one. Gonna put you here on the paper. Well, this is gonna be a long, tedious process. Some of them even will drop themselves or hang by a silk thread. As you can see, some of the caterpillars will make a silk thread and drop themselves. It's a defense mechanism, but when they do this, you can just Try to scoop up the silk thread with the end of your stick. And wow, it's gonna take so much time as you can see here. This is like a caterpillar taxi. Hey, you there, will you up? Oh, dropped himself, you wanna join? Ah, there we go, I have two caterpillars. Oh, that one fell down. You wanna be really careful with these little ones. Ah, will you wanna join? Nope. Well, let's put you in here then. There are so many caterpillars. Where do you even start with this? Let's try and scoop these up. Maybe some of them want to be on my stick and others will just drop themselves to the floor. We'll take care of them later. Ah, nope. You wanna come? Hey there little one, nope. 
It's okay if they fall to the floor, we will take them later. Ah, this one has stuck. Yes, let's take you to your new enclosure, my friend. There you go. These are trying to escape on the edge of the, on the lid of the container, so let's try to coax them. Come here, guys, you wanna join? Oh yes, yes, I have two at the same time, quickly, quickly. Yes. Well, it has taken me a while, but I managed to get all of the caterpillars in here. Some are already walking to the leaf. Although newly hatched caterpillars take uh, up to 24 hours to start eating, because they are basically, they are born with a full stomach, so to say. After hatching, these caterpillars eat part of their egg shell to uh, get their first meal and first nutrition. So when they are born, they are actually not hungry, but they will be after two days. So um, for that reason, they need to be left alone on the food and eventually they will grow hungry and start eating themselves. So we close the lid on this one. Wait, oops. Actually, there's one caterpillar here. I don't want to close the lid on him. Get down, little one. Okay, goodbye. So we're gonna close the lid now and I'm gonna leave this alone for two days and then check back, okay? I'm going to tr disturb them the least possible. So they need some space, some freedom, no stress and they'll start eating. After keeping them in a plastic container for about a week, the caterpillars grow really big and green. And at this point I was trying to move them to their new enclosure. Because you see, I was actually not trying to breed these guys in a plastic container. Plastic containers aren't the best environment for polyphemus moth caterpillars. I just reared the first instar, the most fragile and vulnerable one, to a decent size. And when they are healthy, they go outside. Wait, what? Outside? Yes, literally. Okay, let me show you what's going to happen when they grow too big for the container. Right now, I am hanging the caterpillars in the trees. Yes, hanging them in the tree. This is a big birch tree in my garden that I use to rear the caterpillars using a rearing sleeve. What that is, I'll explain that in a few moments. Oh, and uh, for this scene, I should have been wearing a belt because my ass is hanging out like I'm Kim Kardashian, unfortunately. There was no way to reshoot the scene because I noticed it later. So I guess enjoy the free peek while we move on. Wait, wait, wait. So some of you may be wondering, what the hell was that clip I just saw? What did Bart just edit inside his life cycle video of Anterea polyphemus? Well, I'm standing here behind a huge, tall birch tree that grows in my garden. Uh, turns out I had too many caterpillars to raise in small plastic tubs. So I have emptied the plastic boxes containing polyphemus caterpillars and I released them to free roam here in the tree. Of course this piece is not native here so I'm not literally going to let them free roam which is also a good way to lose your livestock. So what I do is I hang them up in the tree inside plastic bags now these are just not random plastic bags, they are actually uh, manufactured specialized caterpillar rearing sleeves. And here we will uh, take a look at one of them. One side is uh, made from plastic and transparent so you can look uh, through it. And the rest is made from netting which lets through uh, airflow, uh, but also things like humidity and rain. So the caterpillars are basically protected and eating the fresh leaf here. So this is the next step in my polyphemus moth breeding plan. Uh, they are still first and second instar, so very small caterpillars, but uh, I'm sure that they will thrive in here and grow well. So uh, this is not going to be a moth cycles video like the others, because in the other videos I'm raising all these pieces by hand in plastic boxes. But um, this video will skip a large part of its life cycle because well, I'm letting them develop basically by themselves in these bags. 
without me babysitting them. So I will check back on them uh, in maybe two or three weeks when they've eaten all the leaf. And then I will uh, place the bags on new fresh branches that still have leaf. And that's how I do it. So when we check back in a few weeks, I expect the caterpillars to be significantly bigger without any interference of me at all. Long live the rearing sleeve. So before we proceed, I'm going to show you the rearing sleeve. And this is one of my favorite methods of raising caterpillars. You see, let me tell you one breeding secret that I've learned over time. In your house, indoors, is not the best place for caterpillars. You see, our houses have a very uh, specific uh, climate, so if I can call it a climate. The temperature is often very stable, around 21 degrees Celsius, which is considered room temperature. Of course, it can be different according to where you live. If you live in a warmer country, it's maybe above 21 degrees. But uh, generally, room temperature is what we consider to be 21 degrees Celsius. And the air in houses is often very dry. This is because um, we tend to have heating in our houses and a, a radiator can dry out the air. And this is very different uh, here outdoors because here we have natural humidity, we have rain, we have mist. We have all sorts of moisture that keeps the air fresh and, uh, and humid, right? But here's also natural fluctuations of temperature because here outdoors, during the day, when the sun starts shining, it may be very warm. The sun may warm it up to, to 20 to 30 degrees Celsius or more in a good summer day. But at night, there is a cool down. So um, indoors, in a house, the temperature is constant and fluctuates only a few degrees. Um, my house uh, is at night 18 degrees Celsius and during the day 21 degrees Celsius. That's not a lot of difference. Here outdoors, during the day, you can have 25 to 30 degrees Celsius, but at night it can be 10 degrees in summer. And I mean, if you have a bad night, there's warm summer nights and there's cold summer nights, right? But um, the difference between day and night can be a 10 uh, or 15 degrees difference. So that's a lot. That's a lot of difference. And caterpillars actually like this because that's where they live naturally. So if you can breed them outdoors, then please do breed them outdoors. That's something I've learned. Trying to breed everything in your bedroom is not always optimal unless the species that you are breeding is used to constant warmth and rather dryish air I guess now of course the conditions in your house depend a lot on where you live okay if you live in a desert then desert species will like it but not tropical species that need a lot of humidity if you live in a cold country then because of winter the, uh, your house will become very dry because it has to be heated and the air will dry out and tropical species will struggle with this indoors. Um, breeding outdoors should only be done if the climate outdoors where you live resembles the climate of where the caterpillars are native. But this is where the breeding sleeve comes in. The breeding sleeve, as I tell it, is a sleeve and uh, it has an opening here that I can open up. Can you see it? So I can even put my arm inside it. See? My arm is inside it, but you can also close it here with these strings, which will be difficult to do now with one hand. Maybe I can. See? And you can tighten it up. Aha. Huh. Ta da Now in this case I am the tree. I am the tree, okay? But as you can see, it's just completely closed around my arm. The caterpillars are not able to escape from this. And you can just put them outdoors like this uh, on their favorite food plant. And in here the netting is transparent. So that means uh, they will experience all the natural conditions. They will they will feel sunlight. Uh, they will feel humidity, uh, 
basically everything they need that they don't get indoors. And there's this sleeve that I use also has a plastic part that's transparent. You can use this to look at your caterpillars, but it can also protect them from excessive rain. For some species rain is a problem, but uh, some like it, it depends on the species. So that's the point, see? And if you want, you can pull it off, you can open it. See? And what's great about this, you can put this around the food plant and ignore it. The caterpillars will grow for weeks. And you don't have to change the container, change the leaf every day, because they will be in there just surviving. Um, and make sure that you check up on them once in a while to see how they are doing. But there is a lot less maintenance. But it only requires you to have a good climate that the caterpillars can survive in. Uh, the summers in Europe are usually good enough for a lot of moth species, even for tropical species. They don't, uh, they don't really care about uh, colder days. So uh, I breathe a lot of tropical species just in Europe, outdoors, in a sleeve. But it can also be done with North American species, Palearctic species from Palearctic Asia or Russia. It's no problem. Just make sure to avoid uh, very dry periods or periods with a lot of rain. So um, this is, of course, the perfect thing to do is use this with native species because your environment is perfect for the species that already live in it. If you're breeding species that are native to your own country, then sleeve them and it will be so, so easy for you. That's my tip of the day. And now you know what a rearing sleeve is. Yes, indeed, it's true. Here outdoors, the sleeves experience wind. They experience sunlight. They experience natural fluctuations of temperatures and daylight, which is excellent. But they've also seen some bad times, including some pretty heavy rain and storms. And guess what? While it may look horrible to us, the caterpillars really don't mind. In fact, some species prefer these wild circumstances over the dry, constant indoor conditions. So make of that what you want. Sleeving is a very good method to host caterpillars outdoors for species that like your local climate. That being said, be careful with this because there's a risk of them escaping if the, slave if the sleeve breaks, if a bird tears it apart. So never do this with species that could potentially be invasive. Use your common sense, please. What's up everyone? It's ha it has been a few weeks and it's time again to check up on our polyphemus moth caterpillar. So I'm gonna get my ladder and get up there, cut the sleeves down and see what's inside.
guess what? Of course, the caterpillars were looking really, really great. They were the second and third instar, uh, getting quite big, looking green and healthy. And all of this without me touching them for a while. So this has been quite interesting in the sense that this was very low maintenance so far. So all I did, uh, whenever I checked up the sleeves, I opened them up, I took a look at the caterpillars and then I uh, put them back up in the tree, this time on a different branch because they had eaten all the leaves. Oh, and I also made another change. I moved them from small sleeves to big sleeves. I have different sizes for different caterpillars and this time they basically got a space upgrade. Now so far this part has been boring because the small caterpillars are not really that interesting to film. In fact they are hard to film and so hard to see. But after a while they grow uh, to quite a big size if everything goes well, which I hope will happen. So uh, the result on birch tree so far has been excellent despite some storms and hot summer days. They've been thriving. And I put them back up in the tree only to check up on them again later. What's up everyone? It's ha it has been a few weeks and it's time again to check up on our Polyphemus moth caterpillar. So I'm gonna get my ladder and get up there, cut the sleeves down and see what's inside. Now I shall proceed to take a look inside. Ah, take a look. Now, what I am personally seeing here is a wonderful result. I see tens and tens of polyphemus moth caterpillars. They're Camouflaged quite well here on the seeds of the birch tree. As you can see there are plenty full caterpillars here. This is just looking great. These guys are veterans, they have faced heat, they have faced drought. And even the serious storms that have been in my garden recently. What's interesting is that the two sleeves, I have removed, uh, I've emptied both of the sleeves right now. And the two sleeves have given different result. Here we see one sleeve that, uh, and as you can see, almost all the leaves are gone. It's defoliated. Only in the top there are some leaves left, but this was outside of the bag, so the caterpillars could not eat this. Now, if we take this sleeve, we'll see many of the leaves are still on it. And if we take a look, well, the thing is, I do see caterpillars. But definitely not as many, and this is interesting. For some reason, the caterpillars here in this sleeve, in one sleeve, have grown really well. While the caterpillars in the other sleeve, there's almost nothing here. So, I don't know what can cause caterpillars in one sleeve to die, and in the other to do very well. I think it may have to do with ants. Um, if ants get inside a sleeve and they find a hole in it somewhere, then they will go inside and eat all the caterpillars. So I may blame ants. Another reason I could think of is disease, but I don't think it is a disease. Caterpillars that I see still look healthy to me. So yeah, this is uh, this is odd. See, in this, there's not there are a few caterpillars. I mean, take a look at this for example. Here we see Polyphemus moth caterpillar. Um, here's another caterpillar that does have a strange color here at my finger. Strange orangish color. It doesn't look too healthy actually. Um, what I am seeing today is that... Oh, here's another caterpillar. This one does look good to me. See, this, this one does look good. So 
I think they are now uh, instar number three and four. Here's another caterpillar. This one also looks good to me. Oh, this is strange because I have to, I have to do effort to find caterpillars in here. But if we look here, I don't have to look one second. I see here, see there's like hundreds of caterpillars here everywhere. See them? It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. See, it's, it's chock, this leaf here is nine. It's, this is chock full of caterpillars. And if I had to do one estimate, then I would say that in this leaf here, the one that's going well, there's about, there's about uh, 40 to 50 healthy caterpillars. And, um, See, I don't even, I don't have to do effort to find them. This is just, take a close look here. See this? Can you see it? All of this is all caterpillars between the seeds. They're very well, see? So many caterpillars. See? It's, it's full. But if I look at the contents of this leaf here, I have to make, I have to make an effort to find anything. Oh, here it is, see? So there's still some left. But um, I do definitely notice that one sleeve has performed worse than the other. So this sleeve had a lot of losses and the other had a lot of growth. And that's, that's unique, that's strange. Could be ants, could be a disease. Could be that one sleeve was more exposed to the wind than the other one. I mean, uh, they are in the same tree, only if you uh, only one meter apart. But that meter can make a difference. I mean, one could be in the full sun in the morning, while the other could be in the shade. That small things like this make big differences to insect. So, uh, yep. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take my scissors and collect all the caterpillars. And put them here on this uh, on this tray and see how far we go. One caterpillar handling tip is to never rip them off the twig that they are sitting on. For example, here we see a caterpillar, yeah, in my hand. And if I want to, if I would rip this off, I would tear this insect apart. Their legs are very strong, they have a very strong grip. So what I do is I do, I snip the twig. And then I have this, this uh, little twig here I can pick up to handle the caterpillar. Now if it wants to welcome my hand it is fine. But if it doesn't, then don't never rip them off the, the surface. That's what I'm trying to say. That's how I'm going to collect all the caterpillars. So uh, this will take a while. This will take about, about 30 minutes. I'm not going to film it. It would be very boring content for you to see. So we're going to do a small time skip. Hello everyone. This is more or less the end result. How many caterpillars there are in total, I do not know. And I am also not interested in knowing the exact number. I am not one of those breeders who obsessively wants to count his result all the time. I just see that there are quite a few overall. And I am happy, happy with that. There's not, a, there's not as many as I had eggs, because I had like 200 eggs. And if I had to make an estimate, this is like 40 to 60 caterpillars at best. But that's all right. I can take some losses. I have plenty of them. So I don't care if some of them die. I guess only the strongest will make it after all. I think I may have to add a third sleeve. So I have one, I have two. But uh, I think adding number three could be a good idea because these will grow to a massive size fast. And uh, when they start to grow, you really don't want to overcrowd them because they will die. 
they will become very sensitive to being overcrowded. Okay, so I will take some of these caterpillars, like that, put them back in the sleeve, just like this, and divide them fairly over the sleeves that I have here, and hang those back up in the tree. <coughs> Let's go. Hey guys, I have a problem. Turns out no matter how high I try to go in the tree, I am unable to reach the leaves to hang up the bags. This is a problem because uh, basically the caterpillars have eaten all the low growing leaves. And every time I have to change the food, I have to go higher and higher. And this time, this is out of my reach. I cannot reach this with my ladder anymore. So this is really annoying. I was hoping to sleeve all of these without much effort, but it turns out that now I have to raise so many caterpillars by hand. And this is a very risky strategy. So it's more time consuming, but also more difficult. So I'm not sure how to proceed, guys. This is going to be difficult. Okay guys, so here is my problem. First of all, raising the polyphemus moth is generally very, very easy. It's like a piece of cake. So that's not the problem. The problem is that I have so many and I'm not kidding when I say I have about 60 caterpillars. So I am not all too enthusiastic about raising these by hand. The thing about sleeving is it's very convenient. You don't have to um, go in there every week to replace the food. You don't have to clean them every day. You put them in the sleeve, you wait two or three weeks, then you check up on them and change the food or you just let them grow. In fact, if you sleeve caterpillars well, it's possible to leave them in there from uh, basically from egg to cocoon stage if you have enough space and food plant. You can put the caterpillar in there and it will grow by itself without you needing to take care of them at all. So uh, that's, it's a very easy method. And uh, I'm a little bit upset right now that uh, I cannot hang up my old sleeves. I've emptied them, I take all the caterpillars out and put them in this box. And I will keep them in here for now until I figure out what to do. This is not how I had planned this episode and I'm a bit frustrated right now. Uh, this method is also more risky because in captivity when you try to raise caterpillars indoors in boxes it all depends on how often you are there to give them fresh food to clean their container and if you don't they may become sick and die. And this is especially difficult to do if you have a high amount of caterpillars like if you have 60 of them like I have then uh, it becomes hard physical labor to keep them well fed every day and uh, basically you are mass rearing these animals in a container that needs to be cleaned every few days. So uh, that's what I'm gonna do for now is I'm gonna keep them in here until uh, I can figure out what to do with them. At least they have food um, and they have space. The good news is they are not fully grown. They are still a bit smallish, so for now it will still be easy to keep them under control. But when these things grow, wow, these things will eat kilos and kilos of leaves and it will be very exhausting to raise them in a box. So I really have to think about what to do. Maybe I have to get a bigger ladder or change the food plant or change my strategy. We will see. Just as I suspected, this has been an overall terrible idea. The birch tree has grown moldy in no time. Some individuals are, uh, have already started dying in these conditions. 
and escaping from the box. So this is honestly terrible. And uh, if I if I go on with this setup, I'm going to kill the whole brood. So I'm going to get them out and put them inside this moth cage. Now the first thing that some of you guys may say, oh, that thing is extremely dirty. Uh, I agree, but I raised about 13 Nudarelia Dione caterpillars in this. And well, these caterpillars, when they pupate, they, ent they empty their gut content. That means they basically they poop a lot before they um, pupate and turn into moths. And that's what's been left here over the cage walls. I have no time to wash it. It looks disgraceful, but I'm telling you that for the, for the caterpillars this makes little difference. Um, I don't, I'm not very worried about cross infecting or something. Plus they were a healthy brood with no diseases. So uh, I'm going to take the risk. First of all, I'm gonna remove the caterpillars from here into here. Okay guys, so here is my problem. First of all, raising the polyphemus moth is generally very, very easy. It's like a piece of cake. So that's not the problem. The problem is that I have so many and I'm not kidding when I say I have about 60 caterpillars. So I am not all too enthusiastic about raising these by hand. The thing about sleeving is it's very convenient. You don't have to um, go in there every week to replace the food. You don't have to clean them every day. You put them in the sleeve, you wait two or three weeks, then you check up on them and change the food or you just let them grow. In fact, if you sleeve caterpillars well, it's possible to leave them in there from uh, basically from egg to cocoon stage if you have enough space and food plant. You can put the caterpillar in there and it will grow by itself without you needing to take care of them at all. So uh, that's, it's a very easy method. And uh, I'm a little bit upset right now that uh, I cannot hang up my old sleeves. I've emptied them, I take all the caterpillars out and put them in this box. And I will keep them in here for now until I figure out what to do. This is not how I had planned this episode and I'm a bit frustrated right now. Uh, this method is also more risky because in captivity when you try to raise caterpillars indoors in boxes it all depends on how often you are there to give them fresh food to clean their container and if you don't they may become sick and die. And this is especially difficult to do if you have a high amount of caterpillars like if you have 60 of them like I have then uh, it becomes hard physical labor to keep them well fed every day and uh, basically you are mass rearing these animals in a container that needs to be cleaned every few days. So uh, that's what I'm gonna do for now is I'm gonna keep them in here until uh, I can figure out what to do with them. At least they have food um, and they have space. The good news is they are not fully grown. They are still a bit smallish, so for now it will still be easy to keep them under control. But when these things grow, wow, these things will eat kilos and kilos of leaves and it will be very exhausting to raise them in a box. So I really have to think about what to do. Maybe I have to get a bigger ladder or change the food plant or change my strategy. We will see. Oh, hi. Now it's um, it's four days later. I don't still have a good way to film me passing the time. But I checked back up on the box and my acting skills need work. So let's get back to the caterpillars, see how they are doing. Just as I suspected, this has been an overall terrible idea. The birch tree has grown moldy in no time. Some individuals are, uh, have already started dying in these conditions and escaping from the box. So this is honestly terrible and uh, if, I, if I go on with this setup, I'm going to kill the whole brood. So I'm going to get them out and put them inside this moth cage. Now the first thing that some of you guys may say, oh that thing is extremely dirty. Uh, I agree. But I raised about 13 Nudarelia Dione caterpillars in this. And well, these caterpillars, when they pupate, they, ent they empty their gut content. That means they basically they poop a lot before they um, 
pupate and turn into moths. And that's what's been left here over the cage walls. I have no time to wash it. It looks disgraceful, but I'm telling you that for the for the caterpillars this makes little difference. Um, I don't, I'm not very worried about cross infecting or something. Plus they were a healthy brood with no diseases. So uh, I'm gonna take the risk. First of all, I'm gonna remove the caterpillars from here into here. As usual, I'll just take my scissors, cut some parts off like this and remove the caterpillars. I've said this hundreds of times, as I will stress it every time. Do not rip caterpillars off their food plant against their will. You will damage their body this way. The thing is their legs are like suction cups that are attached very strongly to the surface they are sitting on. And their grip is so tight that if you rip them off that you will pull them into two halves. Basically their feet will remain stuck on the, on the surface. But uh, luckily birch tree is very long and thin so you can very easily harvest the caterpillars like this. So that's what I'm gonna do. Um, we've had some losses unfortunately. My brood is not that big, but the good news is there's still many of them. So we still have a chance of ending up with a lot of cocoons. But the big mistake I made in this rearing was uh, being unprepared about sleeving. I thought I could sleeve them from egg to cocoon. And I would have, in theory, but um, the caterpillars ate so much of the leaves that I was unable to hang up the sleeves. The leaves are higher than my ladder, so I guess I'm gonna need a taller ladder now or something. Or just raise them in cages. The bad news is that my sleeving project has failed. For I am no longer able to sleeve all these caterpillars on their food plant as I originally intended. So I will very awkwardly have to raise them by cramming them all in a moth cage. Which isn't that bad, but there's an overcrowding issue. I don't have the space and time to raise all of these by hand in one cage. So there is definitely a risk, a higher risk of infection and die off if I put them on room temperature inside a cage. But there's also good news and that's the fact that, well, some of these caterpillars are looking big and healthy. And this means that we are relatively close to them spinning cocoons. I would say it would take about four weeks or less for most of them to start making cocoons. Um, rearing them in such a high density will be risky and I will be at the mercy of luck. It will take only one caterpillar uh, catching a disease for the whole brood to die and infect each other. Caterpillars are very sensitive to diseases, especially if overcrowded. But if I take the gamble and just, I'm lucky enough to keep them healthy for a few weeks. I think that we may see, co see cocoons quite fast. So, um, this is going to be a gamble. I'm either going to lose the whole brood and have about 50 caterpillars die in my hands, or I'm going to pull um, a successful last resort measure and allow them to survive and still have many cocoons. It's just a desperate situation. I'm, but maybe that's a nice thing to see in this video, an in unexpected problem during the rearing.
So uh, this kind of monster filled with water, not monster energy, will hydrate the twigs for at least a few days, keeping them fresh enough for the caterpillars to feed on. The problem with birch is it desiccates very fast, even if kept fresh with water. So it will not help much, but prolong the freshness of the food plant for maybe one or two days. But this is okay because I have a lot of caterpillars and I think they will eat this in a very short time. So uh, this, those few hours will make a difference, my opinion. This is really the most silly setup I've ever had, but this is, this is a very problematic rearing. And I don't know if it's okay to show this on YouTube. I'm still contemplating if I want to finish this episode of Moth Cycles or not. Because the thing is, I want to set a good example and show a good rearing guide. And maybe it's not such a good idea to upload such a fiddly video where, where things go wrong. But on the other hand, it could be a learning experience to share this online. If we have a happy ending. But um, if it is, it's not going to be a breeding guide. It's just more, of, it's more or less going to be a vlog in that case of just me rearing these caterpillars. But not in the optimal way. And if you want to make a guide, you really want to show the most optimal ways to raise them. And this is not optimal. So that's the thing. I'm kind of in doubt. Anyways, this should be enough food for, let's say, two days, three days. Let's see if these guys approve of it. Whee! Okay, that was a bit crude, but hey, it works. Let's see what they do. Now, if you were wondering how this cage comes into play, this is what I do. Whoop. Um, let's see if it fits. Probably gonna need two hands. Let's see. Probably need, gonna need some stretching to do here, but... Uh, I can't imagine that this doesn't fit, honestly. Oh God, what if I'm wrong? <sighs> this is honestly very annoying. I managed to fit the box inside, but I stretched my case, cage so much that I ripped it. This is honestly very annoying. I will have to order a new one now. Who said making life cycle episodes was easy? So. It's kind of annoying because it's a financial loss and uh, I'm not the most, most wealthy guy in the world. So to sum it up, I just ripped my cage and I ripped the zipper. So there's no way for me to close this cage now. And this is one of the moments I really feel like swearing, but I don't because YouTube will punish me for that and give it an 80 plus rating or something. But internally I am swearing. This has been one of my frustrating rearing experiences so far. Not because this is a difficult to breed species. Actually, in fact, this is one of the easiest species you can breed. But just because so many things are going wrong right now. And I'm not used to things not going my way when it comes to my hobby. So I feel out of control and very angry. <sighs> I will have to find a new cage cram the box inside again at the risk of ripping it again order a new cage and I just feel I mean my original rearing plan already went wrong I wanted to sleeve them inside this tree from egg to cocoon and it failed because the leaves are too high for my shitty little ladder here so uh, they eat in all the low growing leaf already so I have to climb higher and higher now it's out of my reach so I have to cram them inside the box, which is also a failure. And then they really have to be ventilated. And uh, honestly, I just, okay, I'm not, I'm not one of those people who are into karma and this and that. I think it's actually quite stupid. People who are obsessed with the concept of karma, it's a stupid concept. But I do feel there's like just bad energy, bad karma even. In this, in this whole rearing experience and it wouldn't surprise me if tomorrow all these caterpillars started to drop dead because of some disease. Why? Because I'm very pessimistic right now. Everything I tried so far it almost went wrong. Sleeving method went wrong. Now this stupid setup 
Oh my god, it's so stupid. It's uh <sighs> it's one of those days, guys. Let's hope there's a happy ending. If these guys end up spinning some cocoons without massive losses, at least I have something at least I have something of a result out of all this frustration. Man, I want to scream. So at the risk at ruining another cage, I'm going to remove the box and put it in here. Um, I've already experienced that this box is slightly too big to fit into this entrance and if you force it too much, you will, the cage will tear. And I'm kind of scared of that happening. The reason I use such dirty old cages is also because they are expensive for me. Hmm, after all it seems very easy to just push the box inside. I'm not sure what I did to break this one, but uh, here's the zipper by the way. I think I was just too stressed out and too chaotic, it's my biggest flaw. I have a very chaotic mind, I'm disorganized. And uh, pff, man, I'm starting to sound like that sad donkey from Winnie the Pooh, but uh, it's just such a stupid experience so far, guys. I'm not happy, but uh, the good news is, huh, for some reason this cage doesn't have problem at all. They should be the same size, but how odd. Maybe because this is a new cage that I just ordered, so uh, it's not stretched out for many usages yet. These cages are somewhat, this is an older one, it's stretched. So uh, I keep using these cages forever until they break, that's why some of them are so dirty and worn down. Uh, first of all it's plastic and I try not to be wasteful of plastic. When I order plastic things, I try to use them until they are completely broken, because uh, Plastic pollution it's a big thing and disposable plastic cages like this are not good for the environment so I don't want to keep buying new ones just because I want fresh looking white cages. The caterpillars don't care even if it's stained. So um, <clears throat> here's to good luck. Most of the polyphemus caterpillars are here in the bottom right now but some of them are already crawling up into the food. Here you can see uh, one polyphemus caterpillar already enjoying the birch and the rest is are somewhat here in the bottom. Now I'm, I'm hoping that they will go higher in the vegetation because the bottom of the cage is not a good place to be for a caterpillar. That's where all, all the poop falls down to. I know that sounds stupid but if they keep sitting on the bottom, they're gonna sit in their own excrement. I hope some, most of them will crawl up to the top of the cage. So uh, yeah, this is the setup right now. Ventilated, spacious, should be good. So, <sighs> all right. So this is where they are right now. The caterpillars of the uh, polyphemus moth. We're gonna keep this method up for a few weeks and hope, hope to God. Now I'm not religious, but it's an expression. Okay, but let's. Hope to God that some of them will make it to cocoons. Because, oh, this rearing experience so far, guys. It's done more bad for my mindset than good. Usually I get a lot, a lot of happiness and an enjoyment out of my hobby. But I'm also the huge control freak when it comes to my moths. And that's perhaps the reason why I'm relatively successful. 
but it's also one of the reasons it can negatively affect my my mood and personal life sometimes so uh, <clears throat> I think most of them I've seen were like in star I'm not sure if it was three four or five because there's like a mix of small and big caterpillars in there some of them are lagging behind and growing very slowly still small all of them are already like huge so uh, but I'm hoping that a few weeks time we're gonna see some cocoons fingers crossed guys I really would like her to have this to have a positive ending I rarely breed so many of the same species because I prefer breeding many species in low amounts to keep it manageable than one species in a high amount so uh, this is what I consider a high amount I know some of you crazy guys in America I've seen you breeding 200 cacropia moths in one year Raising 300 polyphemus caterpillars or 300 luna moths. Oh god. Insanity. This is not criticism, it's actually... I respect you if you can do this because I certainly can't. It stresses me out too much. So, um, let's skip forward. See what happens. What's up everyone? So it has been about a week time and it seems the caterpillars are still doing quite well in here. The good news is that they are disease free. The bad news is that this is still very risky. Only one of them has to get sick to infect all the others because they are in such a crowded space. But uh, in here we see a lot of fully grown, of um, almost fully grown caterpillars. I think I need about uh, two to three weeks of constant good luck. Uh, I try to feed them every day, giving them fresh leaf and clean their container to minimize the chance of diseases. But uh, let's take a look inside, shall we?
So we're looking uh, inside of the rear ring container. It's very gently poke around here. As you can see the caterpillars are looking quite nice and healthy. They're getting to a big size now. The bad news is yes they're still very overcrowded. This is not a density that I would ever recommend raising this species in. Uh, what I'm doing is just asking for bad luck and infections but uh, I'm really really doing my best. I'm cleaning the box and disinfecting it almost every day. Uh, all the leaf that we see here this is enough food for maybe one and a half day. Uh, tomorrow at the same time all of the foliage will probably be gone and be turned into caterpillar poop. So um, <clears throat> I'm really nervous about this because this was really months of effort. You've seen the video, haven't you? So uh, it would be very frustrating to get this far and fail at the end. That's like running a marathon and breaking your breaking your leg one step before the finish or something. That's how that would feel. So a uh, really really nice fat larva. I'm digging these polyphemus moths, honestly. Nice individual variation in them as too. Uh, some have orange spots, some have pink spots. Some even have little metallic spots. So, uh, seem to really love birch tree. See, and if I wipe away the leaves, we should see that it's, it's chock full of caterpillars in here. See this? It's really bursting with caterpillars. So I'm going to keep them like this in a plastic breeding container and uh, cross my fingers the hardest that I ever have. Thanks for following and uh, let's skip ahead and see what happens. Very good news guys. I am so, so relieved. It's finally happened. Want to take a look? I'll show you what I'm talking about. That's right, cocoons. Today we have the first cocoons. So that means this rearing had a positive conclusion despite all the bad luck and stress we've had. So uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna remove these cocoons immediately, of course. Don't want to leave them in here. Wanna keep them safe, a separate place. So uh, otherwise, looks pretty good. The amount of food that they eat is dramatic though and uh, this is just one day's worth of birds that they've eaten and it's all been converted into poop as you can see it is full of nice uh, healthy caterpillars so that's a positive but uh, I can't really keep up with this amount of eating that they do so uh, in that regard it's a positive thing that they are starting to make cocoons because uh, moment they make cocoons the caterpillars are out of the game and leave more food for the rest. So uh, I'm gonna have to change all these food plants here. And uh, I'm gonna do that in a minute. But first I'm going to scoop out all the cocoons here. So um, I think what I may do is just take this out. Um, remove the branches, take all the caterpillars and uh, count how many cocoons I can find. Uh. 
So, turns out that we have the first five cocoons. Um, five cocoons is hardly something to write home about. But um, it does signal to me that uh, my rearing is finally entering its final stages. Uh, it's just five cocoons, but that means five less mouths to feed. Um, on the other hand though, I think I have 50 or so more to go. But uh, I think most of these will actually pupate quite soon. Uh, most of them in the span of a few days maybe. So um, I'm going to get fresh food for them now and uh, see what happens next. This is very good news. Hey, what's up everyone? Today we continue our episode of Moth Cycles with another vlog. It may not seem like much to you viewers, but um, currently I'm two months into this video. Two months. That's how long it takes to make a vlog like this. So don't underestimate the amount of work I'm doing for this. Anyways, let's take a look inside the container. I see we had some progressions. Now, <clears throat> last time we already found some cocoons and I think all of you will remember that. But um, today it looks like the majority of them are starting to spin. Ah, look at that. Look at that. Very fresh shell cocoon being spun. And I just have to take one look in the container and Im immediately I see cocoons everywhere. So. This is very good. Oh, very good sign here. Look. Oh, there's cocoons everywhere, guys. I'm so happy we did it. This was some serious silk farming, guys. So, um, mm, I have to be careful because the caterpillars are uh, walking around in the container. And they do this when they um, start spinning cocoons. They become restless and uh, start walking around a lot. Now, this makes sense because they're looking for the best place that they can spin their cocoon. So here you can see a few spinning cocoons here under the lid. But this is great, this is great result. I'm honestly very happy with this. So uh, I'm gonna turn the camera off for a moment while I take the box out so we can take a closer look at this. Oh, wow, this is amazing, guys. Welcome to our first serious cocoon harvest. Let's do a little count here. This is some good quality stuff, man. So uh, <clears throat> here we have cocoon number one. One cocoon. So I'm not gonna harvest this cocoon. Obviously this caterpillar is still making its cocoon. So I'm not gonna disturb it and rip it off. So uh, here we see a nice one spun here in the birch, uh, birch leaves. Notice that the, that the very fresh cocoons, they are still white. While older cocoons, they become brown, see? And eventually the, ter the cocoons be become quite dark, like tanned. And um, very uh, tough, a little bit like cardboard. So there we go, here we see more cocoons, see it? So here in the back, so this is cocoon number three. Cocoon number, ah, number four. And uh, there's one thing that we should notice. As you can see, there's still some leaf here on the, on the plant, see it? There's some leaf left. Now this is unusual because every time so far that, that I've taken one look inside the container, the caterpillars had eaten uh, all the leaves. But the fact there are some leaves left, it means, um, well, they are not interested in eating anymore. At least not in this huge amounts. And that's because there are less mouths to feed here. It basically means that all of them are starting to cocoon pretty soon. And um, they don't need much food. Now there are some caterpillars left. Like uh, a low amount, but we'll uh, count those later. And as you can see, the cocoon harvest is going well. Um, these cocoons are very tough. You can just rip them off like this. Like this is no problem. It's very tough silk. Very strong. Oh, there you go. It's Ah, oh, yes. 
And I'm really, really glad to have a happy ending, guys. It makes me so happy. Uh, it makes me happy because I had a lot of stress with uh, making this Moth Cycles episode. I didn't think it was possible for me to raise so many caterpillars in one small uh, plastic container like this. It was really a massive gamble, but I pulled it off. Now what you'll see interestingly, if you relook inside the cage, there's many caterpillars here, but they're on the process of spinning cocoons here. See? They really like these cage walls. There you go. It's harder to rip them off the cage. You see here very fresh cocoons, still white, but uh, let's take a closer look at some of these pup pupating guys here. See? Great. Let me just, oh, this is too fresh. I'm gonna leave this here. This is too fresh. Here, this is a nice sturdy one. I think I'm gonna leave these caterpillars here or something. I don't know. There you go. And we already have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve new cocoons. And I'm not, not yet finished. You know what? I'm just gonna take this stuff out. Just gonna take it out for a second. Boom! There's even a cocoon on the water bottle. It's an original place to spin. Ah, I'm just gonna take this stuff out, otherwise it will just be a mess. Hmm. Just... Ah. Okay, let's take our moth spaghetti put it here for a second i'm gonna closely inspect all the leaves to find all the cocoons but uh, we gotta get that stuff out of here oh there you go such a mess such a mess oof there you go that's much better all right guys so this is what i'm gonna do i'm gonna collect the cocoons and put them on top of this old moth cage here here i have the leaves containing caterpillars and cocoons and here I'm going to put the caterpillars that I find in the leaves uh, on top of my old rearing box here. And we're gonna do a count and separate them. So let's see what happens. Okay, so this is the moth cycles cocoon harvest. And uh, there we go. As you can see here is one cocoon. Up, oh, there we go. See? Another cocoon. It's easy to miss them because they can be very well hidden. Let me show you this one, for example. This one is very secretly hidden in the leaves. Can you see it? So uh, you gotta be careful not to leave any behind. Because this is what you worked for. All your hard work is for these cocoons. So you really want to take all of them. So uh, let me just go through this. Ah, yes. One more. See? One more. One more. All of this is just, see, full of beautiful new cocoons. Ripped it off. See, this is what already in my hands now. Gotta put them away in a few seconds, but beautiful results. And uh, whew, I'm happy to have a happy ending with this Moth Cycles video. Because it's uh, I want to revive this web series. But this is really one of my most ambitious video projects so far. It takes me so long to film all of this. It's basically several months of uh, filming. Every week, a few hours at least. To film the progress all the time and uh, blah blah. So, man, this is just full. Let's see if there's any left here. Oh, sure, sure, there are a lot of cocoons. I'm, I'm sure of this. Okay, so here we see a uh, caterpillar. See it? So not all of them are finished. Uh, this is the ones who are left are some of the slow guys that are left behind. But that's okay. I have the patience for it. So I'm going to very gently take this caterpillar and uh, put it away. I will put it with its friends, as you can see here, still some lonely caterpillars, but uh, these are also fully grown. Give it a week or two and all of them are gone and turn into cocoons. 
So uh, here also some caterpillar left. That's okay. You can take your time, guys. Just very, very gently take it off. There you go. Let's see. <clears throat> yes, another caterpillar. Come here, little guy. Come here. Let's turn you into beautiful moth. Very soon. There you go. Up. Yeah, this is what silk moth farming looks like. So if you're wondering how I get all these moths on my YouTube channel, you sh you'll know that behind the scenes there's a lot of work. It's not just, hey, let's buy some cocoons on eBay and show them off, you know? There's also this rearing walk work involved and uh, I'm not kidding when I say this is serious work. This is serious effort. This is blood, sweat and tears. Doesn't matter if you farm chickens or cows or moths. Taking care of so many animals, it is serious work. Okay, so today I'm gonna give you a breakdown of uh, our current um, rearing status. First of all, um, the cocoons harvest so far, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five. 26, 27, 28, 29 new polyphemus moth cocoons. So this right here, this is um, 29 cocoons in total. So that means that we are guaranteed to at least have about 29 moths that hatch. But we're forgetting something. Remember the previous video? where um, I harvested the first five cocoons. They are not in this video. They, I have them inside, inside my house. This is only the new cocoons that I harvest today. So uh, you can add plus five. So that makes 34 cocoons in total. So 29 new cocoons plus five old cocoons, 35 um, cocoons. So I'm happy with this result. It's uh, a good result of my breeding. But we're not finished because uh, not all of them have made cocoons yet. We have some um, beautiful green boys left in there. One. Let's see, this is more difficult because they don't like to be being picked up. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Let's say this is uh, three of them. Seven, eight, nine. Um, wow, this is uh, this is difficult. <laughs> Let's see. This is um, so. This this is nine. This here is nine. Uh, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 21. And we have some two weird caterpillars here because this one, this is actually a pre-pupa. This is what a caterpillar looks like when it spins a cocoon. But for some reason, this one has not sp uh, spun a cocoon. If you would look inside this, right now, this is what those caterpillars look like. They become stiff and uh, stop moving. This is a pre-pupa. Uh, sometimes, in rare cases, silk moths forget to spin cocoons. But uh, this usually just only happens in captivity. And it happens when a caterpillar is disturbed by another caterpillar when it wants to make a cocoon. And then uh, it is chased away by the other caterpillar. So, uh, and sometimes it's too late to make a new cocoon and they just pupate on the spot. Now in the wild, these caterpillars will not survive, but uh, I will give this one special care. So, uh, I'm not sure if I should count these pre-pupal guys here, uh, that were sadly disturbed when making their cocoon. Uh, I'm gonna see if they can pupate without a cocoon, but I'm not sure if they will make it. If not, uh, I think we can count 22, 23. This is about 23 caterpillars and about 34 cocoon. So uh, do the math. 
23 plus 34. I'm actually really, really bad at math, so. Um, wow, this is embarrassing. Okay, so about 58 individuals, and I say about 58 individuals because it could be that I made a mistake when counting them, you know, it's a little bit chaotic with these these green worms here walking everywhere, so uh, if I made a few mistakes when counting, I mean, it could be 60 of them, it could be 50 of them, but... Uh, All right, so the good news here is that over half of them have uh, made cocoons. So that means that I have uh, half less mouth to feed. But from now on, I can take it a little bit more easy and I will have less stress and have to do a little effort. But the bad news is, yes, we are not finished yet. Um, we still have about uh, 23 caterpillars that need some food and uh, I care about all of them. So. I want these last batches to make it as well. This one here on top has weird black markings on its back. I think it has been bitten by another caterpillar or something. It's like a necrotic spot. But it's not harmful. So I'm going to give these guys some fresh food. And I hope that they also turn into moths. And I take these cocoons back in inside. This is the fruit of my labor. This is the end result of all my work. So I'm quite happy with this. All right, guys, so what I have here is some fresh food from a fresh birch in a water bottle, as I've done the previous few times. And um, I'm gonna raise the last 23 caterpillars and see what happens. I think um, this is maybe one of the last times I'm giving them uh, fresh food, maybe one or two more times at best, but in one in one to two weeks, all of them will be inside the cocoons, I can guarantee you. So um, let's put it inside, put the caterpillars back indoors and see what happens. Good news is that since we have about half the caterpillars, they need about half the food. So I don't have, I don't have like cramped this cage full of food this time. I think they all manage with this amount. I mean, they hadn't even eaten their previous food for the first time. For the first time, they didn't completely defoliate all the branches. So I guess there's about 30 less mouths to feed. This stuff will be more, more convenient for me. And before they all disappear and turn into cocoons, let's take one last moment to appreciate these caterpillars. Because they sure are beautiful. Okay, I've raised a lot more pretty species uh, with flamboyant colors and uh, these are just plain green, but still I like them. They are decorated with these colorful tubercules and as you can see some of them are slightly shiny with a little bit metallic on there. And uh, subtle white stripes on their body. Some of them have very beautiful uh, bright pink tubercules and some of them have rather yellow or orange ones. but. Uh, they are nice caterpillars really, I'm uh, gonna miss them. I don't think I want to uh, raise another generation after this, it will be just a repetition of the same. This caterpillar has a darker color and this one is about to make a cocoon pretty soon. So, uh, Okay guys, happy eating, bye bye. What's up everyone? It looks like finally my rearing of Antorea polyphemus is coming to an end. For the first time uh, almost none of the food plant has been consumed and I'm uh, finding here some of the last cocoons of the last caterpillars. So I really want to get into this right now and see how many there's left. I'm uh, gonna harvest some of these cocoons here by taking them out of the vegetation as you can see and um, see how many cocoons we have and how many caterpillars there are left. Let's check it out. Hmm, interesting. Very interesting. Hmm. 
I just found something that looks a little bit morbid, but still interesting. Here we see a leaf with a dead caterpillar of Andrea Polyphemus. And as you can see, when a caterpillar dies, there's uh, not much left of him except for one empty skin. They turn like into this beef jerky. And this caterpillar must have died a few days ago. But what's interesting is his cause of death, because when we open up this leaf, here we see a cocoon. But this caterpillar here seems to be stuck to the silk of the cocoon. Can you see it? So uh, unfortunately when this caterpillar here decided to spin his cocoon, um, the silk was woven here around the legs of this caterpillar, see? It's stuck. And um, it's caught in the silk fabric of this cocoon. That means it was inadvertently killed by one of his brothers and sisters. So uh, see, it's stuck to the cocoon. Kind of unfortunate, really. Let's see if I can gently get it off without it exploding all over my hands. This is kind of morbid, really. So there we go, I freed it. Here we see still one pupating. Sorry for ruining your cocoon, buddy, but uh, I didn't want this dead old caterpillar to be stuck to the cocoon. That's uh, it's really weird and will become rotten and a dirty mess. But uh, it wasn't necessary to show you this, but I still did because I thought it was interesting. You know, life is not always bees and flowers. You get stuff like this in captivity too. All right, so this is the final status. I just harvested one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, there should be eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 new cocoons. We have 15 fresh cocoons. And the caterpillar status is we have one, two, three, four, five caterpillars left. And out of these five caterpillars, one is already starting to pupate for some reason. And one is already making a cocoon. So these two we can put this apart. And that means there's only three caterpillars left that uh, are still actively eating. Now I'm not going to change this whole setup again for just three caterpillars. That's a bit ridiculous to me. So what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna throw these three guys just in a plastic box with some fresh leaf. Uh, they're probably not gonna like it. This species doesn't like being raised in plastic boxes that much, but you know what, changing this whole huge setup is too much for just the three last caterpillars. So uh, if they don't make it, I guess, well, that's just natural selection for you. Well, that's not natural selection at all, but you get what I mean, man. It is selection. But, um, okay, that sounds very crude. I'm not gonna kill or neglect them. I'm still going to try and rear them. I'm just uh, not going to give them the optimal setup that they need for just three caterpillars. So this brings our total amount of cocoons. I think it's about, wow. I think we raised about uh, 60 of these guys. Let's do a recount. All right, so the caterpillars of Polyphemus moth. They uh, they don't really appreciate being raised in plastic containers like this one. This is a bad setup for them and may potentially have a higher mortality rate. But I'm going to do it anyway because in here are my three last caterpillars and I'm still giving them a chance at survival. They may still make it and they may also not. Thing is I'm not going to build Again, this huge container for just three caterpillars. And not just three caterpillars, the three last caterpillars, the slowest ones. So, uh, <clears throat> I guess I'll check back next week and see if some of them spin a cocoon. It's not like they're doomed. I mean, there's still a fair chance that they will become healthy and make a cocoon in this setup. It's just not optimal, but uh, hey, who cares? What's up lads? I'm uh, up for the idea of doing a little recount and um, having a look at our results and doing eventual um, health inspection on some of the pupa by random selection. So uh, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna point this thing with downwards. Ah, there you go. Now you can see what I'm doing here. So let me adjust this thing here. Yes, there you go. Hopefully now it's clear to you now what I'm doing. So here we have the box of cocoons and I'm uh, just going to do a little count here, see what the results are. So we have one, two, three, 
four, five, six, seven, eight. And we should put this in here. So there's eight cocoons. Nine. Okay. So this would be ten and eleven. It's two cocoons. Ten and eleven. Twelve. Thirteen. Fourteen. Ha! Huh. Look at that. This should be fifteen and sixteen. Seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven. 28 29 man I'm starting to feel like Scrooge McDuck here we were at 29 right this should this should make 30 well that's uh, getting good results so far 31 32 33 34 35 36 37 38 39 40 wow 41 oops Oof. that's okay 42 43 like I said I'm clumsy but uh, I I got it for before I actually dropped it to the 44. I'm distracting myself, sorry. 45. 46. Oops, sorry. 47. 48. 49. 50. 51 that makes about 51 cocoons so far uh, mistakes included you see I'm not that great at counting so when I say there's about 50 cocoons in reality it could be 55 it could be 45 it could be 60 but I am um, Potentially there's about 50 moths here. So that's a really good result really. Um, another thing, there's uh, three more caterpillars left that you saw in the other scene. So that's another potential plus five. Plus there's two other caterpillars still making a cocoon. So in total we will uh, have about 55 cocoons if all goes well. Okay, I expect everyone who is already this far into breeding insects to already know the basic difference between a cocoon and a pupa. But for those of you who are new and watching this, I'll just tell you anyway, the cocoon doesn't refer to the animal itself. The cocoon is just the silk encasing that the caterpillars spin around them for protection. And the actual animal is inside. And this is the pupa. When a caterpillar enters the cocoon stage, it pupates. And some Lepidopterans don't make a cocoon at all. Take butterflies, for example. Butterflies don't make cocoons, they just form a pupa. Because they are too lazy to spin silk. Now, it's perfectly possible, if you are very careful, to cut open the cocoons very gently. And take a look inside. It's possible to do this without harming the animal, but you have to be very careful. There we go. You see it, something is already moving. So I cut open the silk here very carefully. Now, if you're not experienced with this, I don't recommend doing it because if you cut wrongly, 
you can uh, actually cut the insect into half but uh, I am experienced I know what I'm doing so uh, can you see it moving inside that's difficult to see let's get it out very gently come out little guy let's see is this right? Hmm. I don't know if the opening is big enough for me to... Let me just make the opening a little bit bigger. I don't want to risk harming it, so it's better to make this operation safe and easy. There you go. As you can see, it's wildly rigging, wriggling. Come out, little guy. Don't be so scared, man. There you go. Hmm. Maybe if I stretch it a little. Ah, oh, yes, there we go. Come out, come out, little guy. Yes, there we go, there we go. Now, this is what the pupa looks like. Can you see it? There. The negative effect is that these moths, they don't spin cocoons for no reason. You see the cocoon is also a protective casing that mainly protects them against the elements. So uh, if you want to overwinter uh, moths in captivity, you will have to keep them cold in winter. And it's easier to properly overwinter them uh, if you leave them inside the cocoon. Because if you're going to put these guys cold in winter and uh, you wanna want them to survive until spring, then uh, they are pretty tough, these uh, cocoons. This species lives even in Canada where the winters can be minus 20 degrees Celsius. That means it's very cold and freezing. But they can withstand these temperatures uh, partially because they have such tough cocoons. And if you remove the pupa from the cocoons, then you may have a higher chance of the pupa dying in winter. But uh, also because of environmental uh, conditions, if you keep them too dry, for example, or too hot or too cold, then um, your, survi your uh, survival rates will be higher if they are inside the cocoon than outside of the cocoon. You know, think of the animal uh, as being naked when you remove it from the cocoon. You see, if you don't have any clothing, you'll also struggle with, uh, you know, when it's cold outside or rainy. Or even when it's very hot, in uh, some cases you'll get some sun, sunburn quickly if you're not wearing any clothes. I know that's a funny metaphor to use, but it is the truth. So think of it this way. On the other hand, some uh, experienced breeders still want to at least remove a few uh, pupa from their cocoons. It's uh, very possible to, um, to breed these animals while uh, cutting the cocoons open. If you know how to properly do this, it does not harm them. Although uh, for a beginner it may be risky. Because when you cut open a cocoon you risk uh, cutting into the pupa and harming the animal. But uh, it doesn't happen if you have experience with it. So overall you can decide for yourself if you want to do this or not. I myself will leave these cocoons intact. I'm not going to open uh, any of them anymore. I uh, only cut um, two of them to take a look at this pupa here. These two guys, just to do a health check. But um, now that I know that at least some of them are successfully pupating, I, uh, I know everything that I wanted to know. So I'm gonna leave these guys inside the cocoon. A healthy pupa of a polyphemus moth is orange to wine red and will wriggle a lot if you tease it a little. As you can see, the abdomen of this pupa can be seen wriggling a little. See it? So this is what a healthy pupa looks like. I can also tell that this is a male because the antenna of this pupa, they meet in the middle. And this is a characteristic of a male polyphemus moth. Um, it's perfectly possible to remove the pupa of this moth from their cocoons. But if you are a beginner who is new to all of this, I don't recommend doing it. Um, it, has, it has positive and negative effects. 
and if it's worth the risk you'll just have to decide for yourself. One of the positive uh, benefits that removing the pupa from the cocoons has is first of all you can tell the gender. You can see if this is a male or a female by looking at the antenna that are on top of the pupa. So uh, this is not possible if you leave the animals inside their cocoons. This is a benefit. Another benefit is that you can see if they are healthy or not. If they are inside their cocoons, you're not going to know if they successfully pupated or if the uh, animals are dead. But in this case, it's very easy to see if the pupa moves when you stress it. And if it does, it means that the animal is healthy and uh, will hatch if you properly care for it. This is more a bit of a surprise if you leave the animals inside their cocoons. It's also pos possible to put them back inside the cocoon if you really want. It's better to do this with my fingers. You can just insert it here back into the silk very gently. There you go. Just put it back here in this silk house. There you go. And you can just put it like this. When a moth hatches, it will crawl out of the opening. As for a proper enclosure, you can uh, use a moth cage. Some of these are available for sale online. This is also what I raised my caterpillars in. Same type of cage. Uh, if you think moth cages are too expensive, you can also use a laundry basket or you can improvise something yourself. And they will be fine if you keep them like this in room temperature. Um, they will appreciate it if you spray them once in a while with uh, and mist them very lightly with water. This is however not a necessary requirement. They can survive in room temperature as well if you just keep them dry. But uh, the moths hatch easier if the silk doesn't dry out and become very tough. It makes it harder for them to escape. So now the next question is, Bart, when are these cocoons going to hatch? And the answer is, I don't know. I think there's a chance that they will hatch this year. But it really depends on what the insects feel like doing. You see, in the wild, these um, insects can have one to four generations. And in the most cold places where they live, such as Canada, they play it very safe and only make one generation a year because the, the winters are very long, summer is short. So they decide like, oh, okay, screw it. I'm just going to overwinter right away. I'm not going to risk breeding too late and uh, winter catching up with me and me freezing to death. But in warmer places, such as the subtropical Florida, but also the warmer places like Texas, they can have three to four generations a year. And if the moth decides to overwinter or not, it depends on its environment. But uh, these are raised in captivity in artificial conditions, so I don't really know if these insects will feel like hatching the same year or trying to overwinter. If they are really going to overwinter, it means that it will be at least half a year or longer before I get to see any moths. If not, then we will see the moths hatch in just a few months time. So uh, I'm just going to keep them on room temperature for now. And if they don't hatch until winter, then I put them outside in the cold. But for now, I'm just going to wait and see what happens. Now, probably the longest part of the rearing, also last the shortest in the video. That's waiting for the cocoons to hatch. It took one and a half months for the first Borlefemus moth to hatch from their cocoons. But that's not really something I can film on YouTube. Me waiting for moths to hatch from their cocoons for two months. So instead you'll just have to believe me. Although I thought it was important to stress the fact that this took a lot of time. Because when we jump from the second I'm showing you the cocoons to me showing you a moth a few seconds later, then you don't take into account how much time and waiting there is involved when you do things like this. So meanwhile I was just breeding other species, studying, moving on with my life, doing the things I usually do. But then something happened. Dun 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 dun! Great news everyone! I just came home from work and guess what I found? Our first specimen of the polyphemus moths that we raised together on YouTube. And this specimen is very interesting. She's a female. And she has one particularly um, interesting trait that we don't see often. As you can see here, the hind wings. Can you see these eye spots? They have a very um, 
large amount of black scaling around it. Can you see it? It almost looks like makeup, like uh, eyeliner. So this makes her interesting. This is um, not something that the average polyphemus moth have. Some of them have traits for uh, darker scales and uh, some of them express them uh, more so than other moths. In captivity this happens more often as uh, it's probably a recessive trait that um, probably pops up, expresses itself uh, more easily when um, there is some degree of inbreeding. So basically that means recessive uh, traits are stacking up and you're going to see them expressed more often in captivity um, since carriers of this gene could be rare in the wild so that means uh, the chance of two recessive individuals pairing with each other is very low but related specimens when they pair with each other then uh, you know they have they tend to have the same genes so that's easier to get uh, expression of recessive traits anyways this is moth number one there's probably about uh, 50 of them more to go now my goal for this video is to pair them if I can uh, if I cannot then uh, that's the end of the video if I can, uh, I will continue the video until I'm able to have a copulation as well. That's how you know how we have the whole cycle in uh, in one video. So, uh, as you can see, she's sitting on her old cocoon here. Here we can see the underside. Let's show the underside here. See? Very nice uh, camouflage stuff. So, uh, yeah, I'm happy with this, guys. We uh, managed to do it. This is... Um, the culmination of all our effort, uh, all these months of rearing, taking care of the caterpillars, all this stress uh, about failing, you know. Oops, there she goes. She's a wild specimen. Here you can see the old cocoon. Can you see it? Spun here on a birch twig. Um, turns out it has barely taken a month for them to hatch. So uh, it's very clear to me that these moths are not going to overwinter. They are not going to enter diapause. Um, my guess is that all of them are going to hatch this very year. So, uh, let's see. I can scoop her up. There you go. Look at that. I just heard a sound. Never mind. This is some excellent silk farming, isn't it? And if you like this kind of video, you're lucky. I'm uh, going to try and make more of uh, different species as well. Uh, they're difficult to make, take several months. Very, you know, high effort, very expensive video. But uh, hey, you know, it would be, it, I thought it would be nice to do some little uh, more effort than I usually do for YouTube. So uh, this is guys. And since this female is special, I'm gonna give her a name. Her name is going to be, hmm. Hey there cutie, what's a good name for a female polyphemus moth with uh, very nice eye spots that have a lot of black makeup? I think she's a little bit edgy person because uh, she's like the type of girl who has a lot of black eye shade. I'm gonna name her Belladonna. It's a reference to Nightshade, Atrofa Belladonna or something. Oh wait, am I even right? I mean, I could be completely wrong here. But, uh, oh no, I think the common name of some type of uh, nightshade, the deadly one, was called Belladonna. Anyway, I don't know. I don't know anything about plants. That's her name. So uh, I hope Belladonna will have um, a nice boyfriend soon. So uh, no, that's not going to be me, guys. I stick to humans. But uh, if a male hatch, it would probably be very easy to pair her. So uh, I hope that happens means that we probably have a few hundred eggs and uh, there's uh, 60 cocoons more to go. Wonderful, wonderful result. Now I'm not gonna show and I'm not gonna highlight every single moth for five minutes like I do right now. But this is our first specimen that's something to celebrate so uh, it's just taking a moment of appreciation here. Completing the full life cycle of a moth on YouTube it's not easy work my friends. I did it all for you. There you go. Oh, that's just lovely. <laughs> Such wonderful creatures, guys. I love moths. Did you know that? Oops. Oh, Belladonna, you're a wild one. Oof. 
Okay, okay, we get it. She probably likes me. Probably smell like moth pheromones. I can't blame her. I do smell pretty nice. Anyway, um, I'm really tired. I just uh, had a full day's work. My minimum wage job in a DHL warehouse. Uh, life is tough. So I'm gonna retire Belladonna for a second. I, and here I have my lovely moth cage. It's the same cage that we raised the caterpillars in, by the way. So, uh, I'm gonna take her. Whoops. Place her inside the cage. Uh, I'm gonna take a break, take a shower, get ready for work tomorrow. While, uh, meanwhile, Benadonna, Belladonna will be waiting for me to get home. And hopefully a male. So it would be good to have like, a nice pairing of them on YouTube. There you go. See, she's inside the cage. So um, let's see what happens soon. Over time, more moths started hatching. And I was very happy to see these beautiful animals hatch from their cocoons. I've bred these several times before, but the Polyphemus moth has a special place in my heart. And no matter how often I, I see these guys, they keep amazing me every time. I was also very glad that this rearing was a success because this is the first time in my life I tried to make a big YouTube video like this one and the amount of planning involved in my personal life was tremendous and it was a completely new experience for me. Now if this project would have failed then I would have been very sad and discouraged from making long videos like this one. So, the relief of succeeding was not just because I would like to see the moths, but also because I was emotionally invested in this project, because I really wanted to finish this video. Polyphemus moths are really awesome creatures, and they have two beautiful and amazing eye spots on their hind wings. They are an excellent species to breed for beginners. Okay, one more close-up of my favorite Polypemus moth that I uh, raised so far. Because she's just that beautiful. Look at that heavy coloring. I don't know what it is about her, but this is, this is my favorite uh, about, uh, of the whole batch of 60 moths that I raised. And some of them come with very nice color traits. Because uh, as you can see, this one has very nice chestnut uh, dark forewings. And... Well, just look around. Take, take, just take some notes here of the variation. I mean, these moths here are old and damaged. They are, um, they've shredded their wings. But it's still easy to see that this specimen here is like light brown. And this one is see more chestnut. This one is more dark chocolate colored. And it's these subtilities, these uh, variations that really make me love this species so, so much. Uh, I really hope that you guys enjoy this episode called Moth Cycles, because if you guys like this, I will do it again next year in 2020. And I plan to raise hundreds of Luna moths, uh, hundreds of rosy maple moths, desert hog moths and more. But it's so expensive, so time consuming to do this. This is like a first test. I really want you guys to enjoy this. Because I'm really enjoying making this, but it also needs to pay off for my channel. Now, as you can see, some of my other moths are starting to look a little bit uh, crappy. These guys are still alive, as you can see. And these are about uh, two weeks old now. And it may look uh, kind of cruel and weird, but this is absolutely normal. The Polyphemus moth is a Saturnid moth from the uh, Silk Moth or Emperor Moth family, uh, scientific name, the Saturnidae. My favorite uh, types of moths. And sadly, these moths uh, only live for about one to two weeks because they have no functioning mouth parts they uh, cannot eat unlike most butterflies and other insects so um, basically they are more or less doomed to starve because they run out of energy after like two weeks so and because of that you know there's a saying and it's also one of the basic rules of biology and this is use it or lose it now, because uh, these moths don't live for very long, 
they're not uh, really built for sustainability. Now, their wings are actually uh, perfect um, for, for what they do. Uh, they can fly very well. It's just that, uh, you know, there's not much sustainability in their design. Uh, I don't like to call it a design because that implies that it's something designed. And I very much think it's something that uh, evolved and is not designed. But that's a different discussion that I really don't want on my YouTube channel. Anyway, um, what I want just want I guess what I just wanted to say is that their design is not really sustainable because um, when they fly, basically bits of their wings break off. And for the moths it is no problem because these moths only live for two weeks and they can still fly with wings that look like this okay it looks sad to humans but for the moths that is fine and usually they die of old age before the wing damage impairs their survival so to say now i also have to say in captivity this happens faster because the moths they are here in cages so when they fly they start like bashing against the cage walls and this basically uh well causes the wings to damage faster than they would in the wild. However, that doesn't mean that this is unique to captivity. Uh, anyone that studies biology or is a moth trapper can tell you that in the wild sometimes uh, also moths come to, to light that are heavily damaged. So maybe not like this. Here's an extreme one. She basically almost lost her hind wings. but. Uh, in captivity this is also not a problem. These moths are in many cases still able to uh, pair and lay eggs just fine. Looks kind of, you know, it just looks kind of weird to us humans, but you know, because of their short lifespans it's really not a problem. Also their rings are more or less lifeless, so they don't feel it. Uh, that being said, I don't think insects feel pain at all. But for those of you who are concerned of the well-being of these animals, I'm telling you there's absolutely no way. Uh, there are no nerve uh, cells in their wings, so they don't have any feeling, so to say. But uh, this is just a biology lesson for you. Okay, look guys, so you see this moth here? It's already dead. They only live for a week or two and then they just, they just die, like this old male here. And on my YouTube channel, you'll see a lot of perfect looking moths but uh, behind the scenes actually it's it can be difficult uh, to film uh, perfect looking moths because i only i only film the very fresh specimens that just hatched because i want to show you the best quality animals um, that look representative for the species and not shredded moths on youtube because uh, except when i'm making moth trapping videos then i'll make an exception now, seeing an old and damaged moth like this, it really doesn't bother me at all, to be honest. Because you know what? Beauty fades. Beauty is fragile, especially in nature. And I feel like there's too many people out there who appreciate the rose, but they don't want to deal with its thorns. It sounds a little bit philosophical, and it is. But it's about the way that we view nature, you know? And I think beauty is definitely something that, you know, it's, it's fragile, it's something temporary when we look at nature. And this is, this is part, this is also part of, um, of who we are. And this is also part of what nature is. And, you know, these were their wings being all shredded up it's also a natural part of the life cycle of these moths it happens in the wild too so you know it doesn't really bother me to see them like this i remember when i was catching moths in uh, asia maybe you've seen it on my youtube channel my moth trapping videos at one point this really big old atlas moth showed up and it was it was shredded you know there were parts of its wings were missing and everybody was like, uh, that's, that's an old thing. And I was like, wow, it's beautiful. And 
this is uh, I think that's one of the reasons why breeding doesn't bother me why I don't care to keep the animals in life uh, instead of killing them from my collection and keeping them in perfect condition because I can appreciate this just as much as a fresh beauty you know biology isn't just about superficial beauty a collector will look at the rose and say that's a nice flower but the biologist sees the rose and its thorns and it will appreciate it for its whole you know the bigger picture not just the superficial beauty and that's what i do i appreciate these insects i really love them because they are so fascinating and also because they're beautiful of course but not only because they're beautiful also because they are just so you know so interesting and them becoming old and ugly it's just another interesting part of their life cycle honestly and hey i know i look very sexy but uh, in 60 years i probably won't look as good as i do now although i could i could go with a diet i'm uh, getting chubby lately but uh, i hope you understand what i'm trying to say don't be sad when these moths break down it's supposed to happen and it's part of who they are just as becoming old and dying it's part of who we are as living creatures you know it's a cycle of life okay that's enough for today I'm not sure if very basic biology lessons are necessary because this video is about breeding the polyphemus moth and I feel like people who are already breeding moths uh, should already know their bi basic biology but I guess this moth is also a beginner species so for those who don't just a quick lesson it's very easy to see which one are males and females because here we have a male here we have a female and I'm gonna spoil the answer right now so uh, cut the crap just look at the antenna okay as you can see, the, the antenna of this female are barely noticeable. I mean, I probably have to make a close-up so that we can see them at all. See these pathetic little thingies here that I'm touching with the stick now? Yeah, that's her antenna. Now if we look at the male, yeah, that's very noticeable, right? You don't need to be some kind of pro-entomologist to see this. I mean, it's very basic, it's very easy to see. Uh, the males also, they tend to be smaller than the female, because, but this is not always true because you can have exceptionally big males and you can have exceptionally small females that are outside each other. But uh, if you would really generalize their size uh, using many specimens, you'll see that on average the male is smaller, female is bigger. Males also have a little bit more slender curved wings here, because the females have more rounded wings, bigger wing surface area. Of course, females also have a larger body and different genitals. Um, that's it for now. Polyphemus moths don't live for very long. In fact, they only live for about 10 to 14 days, sometimes even shorter. That's because they have no functioning mouth and cannot eat. So the moths literally starve when they run out of energy after about two weeks. This all sounds pretty bizarre, but it's actually normal for insects. And there's many insect families that have the same mechanism. For example, there's a few beetles that don't have a mouth. And the adult stage is just for reproduction. But there's also a few flies and other creatures like this. That's because the imaginal stage, the adult, is just there to pair, aka find a partner, lay eggs and die. And all the growth and development the gathering of biomass happens in the caterpillar stage, but not in the adult stage. And guess what? It's a successful recipe. It works. And the whole, almost all silk moths don't have a functioning proboscis. Let me talk to you about pairing the polyphemus moth. If you have a male and female, place them together in a cage. And place the cage, perhaps, outdoors. These moths come from a temperate climate and they can tolerate cooler nights. Not cold, but cooler. And they will pair even when it's about 10 degrees Celsius. They just need a warm place, uh, undisturbed dark night, 
and they shouldn't be overcrowded. One or two females per cage and two to four males is enough. But the problem is if you place too many females together in the same cage, the males will be confused because they can only find her by smell. And if there's a lot of females in one cage, they will sense the smell coming from all directions and get a sensory overload. It's very too easy, uh, easy to see if the moths have paired, because if they have, the male will attach himself to the female by the abdomen and he will basically hang below her, which looks a little bit silly, but that's the way that most big silk moths pair. All in all, it's very easy. And when the female is fertilized, she will lay a few hundred eggs. I said it before and I'll say it again today. It looks like a curse has been cast upon me because every time I make a video of a lonely single male moth and I upload it, a few moments after a female starts to hatch. And the same just happened with my polyphemus moth. I just uploaded a video of this male. I was talking about how I want to pair this beauty. And guess what? Moments after, he was not single anymore. A female just hatched for him. However, she's still drying her wings and looks a bit weird. But here she is. She's trying to inflate her wings. That's why her wings aren't looking very straight. She's pumping them up and drying them. So it's important not to disturb her too much. But I'm going to place these two together in the same cage. And see what happens tonight. Hopefully they will make some sweet love and produce moth babies for me. So what I do is I take this pop-up breeding cage. I take carefully take the meal. Don't worry, I know how I should safely handle moths. Whee! There you go. Then I very carefully stick the stick with the female. She's very vulnerable at this moment and needs not be stressed. Her wings look a bit weird to be honest, it's not normal. I hope she will be a normal looking specimen, but even if not, Females with strangely shaped wings can still pair. Ah, going to place her there with stick and all. Tonight she'll probably release some pheromones and call the male here. And we're going to check back tomorrow to see what happens. So I placed the cage in here in my trashy looking garden shed. But this is at least protects them from rain. They still have ventilation, natural airflow. This old thing they're in, this is my old moth breeding cage. This one with shelves. I had it for a few years, but it broke down. So uh, yeah, female still weird looking. The wings are not looking their normal shape. I think she's a little bit malformed. But uh, here we see the male. Well, tomorrow I guess we'll find out what happens to the Columbia and the Polyphemus. Ah, good morning everyone. Now the question will be is, was I successful? I don't know, I'm going to check, but the answer is probably yes. Because of course, I'm a professional. Now, let's see what happens here last night. Aha! Do you see that? Yeah, it's a successful pairing of the Anterea polyphemus. As I expected. Now, it could be that when I open this cage they stop pairing because I disturbed them, but that's okay, they already done what they had to do. Ah! As you can see the male is attached to the female, he doesn't even need to grip the surface. So that means, yes, I am going to raise this species this year. This is good news. Polyphemus moths in their natural range can be found throughout most of America, along both the west and east coast of North America, and even a small part of Central America. They are very polyphagous and in captivity can be raised on things such as oak tree, quercus, 
Salix, Willow, Robinia, Honey Locust, Betula, Willow, Sweet Gum, Liquid Umber, perhaps even Eucalyptus, Cherries, Prunus, and I probably forget a lot because these moths have a lot of host plants. It's not a joke. They are very polyphagous and they will especially appreciate most ridiculous kinds of trees and shrubs. The cocoons of polyphemus moths can be overwintered in winter, should they not hatch in autumn. Then they will probably lay dormant until next spring. The cocoons are very cold resistant and if you just place them outside, even better if you place them in a box that will isolate them against the worst of the worst frost and rain, then they will probably be fine. In the wild, some of the places where these moths overwinter can become minus 20 degrees Celsius, which is very cold. They probably won't freeze to death, but you don't have to overdo it. Just make sure they are properly isolated in a box full of moths or wrapped in towels. That should work. Although it is more or less a woodland species, they are very adaptable and they can also be found in suburbs and parks for that reason. Just because there are so many food plants they are willing to feed on. But they can also tolerate a wide range of microclimates and temperatures. These moths are even found in the subtropical parts of Florida and the hot and dry parts of, uh, of America such as Texas and Arizona. What's also interesting is despite living in such warm climates they're also found very far up north even further north in New York and even parts of Canada where the winters can be very cold and the summers are shorter. So this demonstrates how adaptable this species is. Something I find really interesting. This moth here is a true survivor and it may also be the reason that they are relatively easy to breed in captivity for a beginner. This also answers the question what do I do with all my dead moths? I throw them away because they look like this. Oops! The wind blew it away. I guess that one still wanted to make his last flight. Anyway, this is not something that anyone put, uh, would put in his collection, right? Um, the perfect looking butterflies that you see in the frames are basically killed for the purpose of collecting them. These guys have lived their regular life and thus they look very ugly right now. Now, there are those times in life where we sadly have to say goodbye. And this is one of them because my moths are pretty much dying. There's not much left of my rearing at all. And here I have a whole container full of dead moths that died today. Um, it's sad, but it's also normal. And if you breed a lot of moths, you get used to it. These guys only live for two weeks. But if you did it right, then you will have thousands of eggs by now. Enough to start a new moth cycle. But this video series only shows you one cycle uh, from egg to adult. So I'm not going to film the next generation. Probably going to trade some eggs with my friends. Uh, but to me this is really the conclusion of uh, my video. Thank you for watching Moth Cycles. and. I guess we will go to the rearing rundown to see what we have learned. Here's a fun fact for you. Not all our cocoons have hatched. I have about 15 cocoons left. But I'm going to end the episode right now. Why you wonder? Well these cocoons are not going to hatch anymore this year. They are still alive. But these cocoons have decided to overwinter. That means that I'm filming this in 2019, but these cocoons are going to hatch in 2020. That means basically almost half a year or longer later. Now why is this? Here's a, a funny thing to think about. 
I raised all these caterpillars in exactly the same conditions, the same temperature, the same light, the same food plant. But still, some cocoons decide to overwinter, while others do not. Why does this happen? Well, it's basically a survival strategy. You see, they have um, a partial uh, second generation. A partial generation means that some individuals will decide to overwinter and others will not. And if you think about it, this is very clever, although uh, it's not an active, intelligent decision that they make, it's ingrained in their biology. But think of it like this, did you know that the populations of moths and butterflies fluctuate a lot in the wild? And that's because there are times um, that the conditions are really bad for them and there are times that the conditions are really good for them. Um, think of it like this, imagine that a disaster happened um, that wiped out almost all the polyphemus moths that are alive right now. Imagine that there are some crazy moth hater, he is like Goku, he can teleport and he can instantly kill all the polyphemus moth and that all these moths in North America would be killed. Um, will the species be extinct? No, because these sleeping cocoons uh, can hatch the next year and repopulate. Now, my example sounds really extreme. Um, there's no moth killing Goku out there. But something of apocalyptic proportions happens in the insect world quite often. For example, epidemics of diseases and parasites are very common. Or it could be a bad year for the host plant. Or the climate could be bad. For example, there's a heat wave. Or maybe it's a really bad summer and there's a lot of rain. This can really negatively um, impact the populations of wild moths, you know. When it's, perhaps they are not disasters of apocalyptic proportions, they can be to insects. And some year, uh, insect populations have such high mortality rates that they completely crash, that like 80 or 90 percent of them die. This is serious. And just to have a backdoor, some of them decide to overwinter, where others of them do not. So it's basically they are spreading the risk. Think of it like this. Do you remember when the US government made a mistake and sent everybody who was living in Hawaii um, a warning that a ballistic missile was inbound from North Korea or something. <laughs> and some people ran to safety shelters because they thought that they were going to get nuked. And other people were like, yeah, whatever, I don't believe it. I, I will go on with my day. I will go play some golf. I will go to McDonald's. I don't care. And imagine that this bomb really dropped. Then uh, what would have happened is that the people that didn't care would have probably died. And the survivors would have been the people who uh, ran to a shelter, right? So uh, the people who took extra precautions. But the other way around, the people who go into a shelter have a disadvantage compared to the people who don't care and just go on with their day. Um, the moths that go into hibernation are like the people who immediately go into the shelter, who would repopulate the world if the rest was wiped out by a nuclear bomb. And it's a very stupid metaphor, but it works if you think about it. My native language is not English, so uh, I am not a very eloquent, well-spoken person. So I have to, have to think of creative ways to express myself. Um, but it's actually normal. And despite being raised in the, in the same conditions, uh, what makes the difference that some individuals decide to overwinter and others do not? Well, it's for example, uh, changes in hormone. Not every human has the same amount of testosterone, even if they are males. Some of them have more manly traits and other, uh, for example, may have less testosterone. Uh, same for females, some may have more estrogen than others. And these hormonal balances, they dictate your behavior. Um, for example, if you have more adrenaline, for example, then you could be more aggressive or more easily scared. And hormones also decide in insects when they are going to hibernate under influence of things like a juvenile hormone, stuff like that. So, chances are if you are watching my channel next year and you see me upload a video of polyphemus moths, 
then chances are that they are the same moths from this episode of Moth Cycles. Now I could go all the way and overwinter them in this episode, but you have to imagine why I don't decide to do this, because overwintering cocoons, uh, it's, now, it's now August, right? Almost September. Uh, so it means we have this November, December, January, February, you know, March is perhaps still too cold. I think in April it's safe to hatch some of the moths maybe. So it would be like six or six or seven extra months of time for five minutes extra video. So you just have, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to store these cold. I'm going to keep these outside in my garden. Uh, even when it gets like minus 20 degrees Celsius here, when it's snowing. These guys have to be kept cold in winter. They come from Canada even, where it's very cold in winter. So uh, you just have to imagine me uh, finishing that part. I think most of the moths have hatched. We, how many cocoons did we raise again? Like 60? Yeah, that's a reasonable amount. And uh, what I showed you in, on the cameras, like, um, well, like 40 of these moths hatching and another 20 or something decide to overwinter. These are not the exact numbers, but uh, well, look at this. This is certainly more than 10. See, this is still some of the cocoons that I was breeding. But uh, hey, I guess that also gives me something to breed in 2020. So uh, not all my moths are wasted. Next year I also have some videos to make of Polyphemus moth. And that's cool, right? Maybe I'll do a separate overwintering video. But uh, the point of this mini-series called Moth Cycles is that I just show you the life cycle of one species from egg to adult. And we did that. I don't have to wait for 100% of the cocoons to hatch. I am satisfied and, hope, and I hope that you are satisfied too. So on that note, I'm going to move on to the second part of Moth Cycles, the breeding review. Thank you. Last but not least, I want to give the breeding tip of the day. Because this rearing gave me a lot of stress. Things went wrong, my sleeving plan went wrong and I had to put them in a different box. And in the end it paid off because I was still successful, but I didn't know that at the time. I had a lot of annoyances and sleepless lights. Uh, I was afraid that my video was going to fail and I had to film it all over again next year. And oh my God, it would have been such a headache. And because of that, my breeding tip of today is don't be this guy. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. My caterpillar. It's not eating. It's just sitting there. I don't understand. Why is this? Hello? Hello? Look, I gave it leaves, I gave it everything it needs. Hello? Hello? Please, turn into a moth. Please become a moth. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to call Bart Koppen. Oh, that must be my twin brother. I think he has problems with breeding his insects again. That guy is such a newbie. Hey. Hi there. Yeah. Of course, of course. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I understand it, that there has been a misconception here. Because you probably think that the only thing I do all day is breed moths, but that's not really true. YouTube 
is just my hobby. Breeding insects is just my hobby. It doesn't really pay my bills, okay? I am a student. I also work. I have several multiple jobs, okay? And most of these jobs are boring. They don't even revolve insects, as you've just seen. And even if they do, uh, they are not breeding them. So, I understand if you think I have nothing else to do but breed moths. But that's just the only thing I show about myself online. Because I am not interested in showing you my private life. I don't show you my relationships. I don't show you my friends. I don't show you my work. Unless it is work with insects. I don't show you how I pay my bills and the things I have to do. I don't show you how I have to maintain my house. How I have to live my life. You know, the social things that I have to do, whatever, blah, blah, blah. The point is, okay, the point is, if you want to breed moths, you don't have to be emotionally involved in it for 24 hours a day. Sometimes it's healthy to let it go, okay? And if you can let it go, it is less stress for you, but also less stress for the animals. Because they don't like being handled all the time. You shaking their container, you changing the food every... No, no, no. Sometimes you just have to leave them grow. Okay? They say you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. You get that saying? That's a proverb, right? You can lead a horse to water, but you can't force it to drink. The same is true for caterpillars. I mean, you can give them the good food plant, the good temperature. But you can't force feed them, you can't, you can't turn them into moths by sheer willpower alone. You have to give them the time to do it. You can provide the optimal conditions, but you have to give them the time to do it. So that's my tip of the day. Is don't be overly emotionally invested. By the way, it's not only better for the animals and for your stress levels, but it's also a self-fulfilling prophecy because if you think that you are going to fail, you are more likely to fail. Ever wondered why placebo uh, medicines are a thing? That's because if I give you a pill, and even if it's secretly not a pill but just a piece of candy, but you believe that it's medicine, you are going to feel better because you believe that you are going to feel better. And that's your emotional state, right? But it also has effect on your confidence. If you think that you are going to succeed, then you are confident in yourself. If you think that you are going to fail, you are not confident and you are more likely to fail just because of your own anxiety and stress. So that also plays a part in it, okay? Let it go. Let it go. That was my message. Now continue the polyphemus moth. Having sleepless nights because of your hobby. Moral of the story is don't do that. Just make some distinct time in your life that you work on your caterpillars and use all your other spare time for something else so it doesn't leak over and you don't stay awake at night worrying about your caterpillars. Good night everyone. Ah. <clears throat> Part number two, the breeding review. Each of these videos consists of four different parts. But don't worry, not all four of them are as long as the first rearing part. Yes, that's right, you've just watched me breed uh, Anterea polyphemus for two and a half hours. And this video is still going on. That's because I'm all or nothing. Either I make effortless videos to, to take one minute to make, or I make three hour long videos. This is really all or nothing when it comes to Bart Coppens. So um, in this part we discuss what happened and we review uh, the breeding of um, Anterea polyphemus. So um, first of all, no, it didn't go as I expected to. I wanted to finish the life cycle from egg to moth uh, inside these rearing sleeves, but that didn't happen because for some reason the caterpillars ate so much, I had to change the sleeve several times. And at one point, at one point, I couldn't reach the tree anymore. So then I had to rehome them in this uh, weird plastic box setup. And I was really, really lucky to. Um, I was really lucky to be able to raise as many moths as I did, 
because the setup in this uh, rearing cage was really not the optimal thing. So uh, first of all, mortality. I started with about 200 eggs. Uh, I had so I had sold some. I traded some with my friends. But the ones I tried to raise was about 200 eggs and out of that we got about 55 moths. Now the survival ratio of egg to moth should be around 30%. Is that bad? No, I think that's a good survival ratio. Especially for the big number of moths that I bred. Now if you give me 10, 10 eggs of Anterea polyphemus, I could probably raise them to 10 moths. But the more and more eggs you get, the more difficult it becomes to keep all of them alive. Think of it like this, if I gave you two chickens and told you, okay, in two months time, I want you to keep all of these chickens alive. Now, then you're probably not, I mean, they're probably not going to die, right? And you will have a 100% survival rate. But if I give you a chicken farm that uh, perhaps has uh, 10,000 chickens in it, and I tell you, okay, I'm going to come back in, uh, in two months and I want all the chickens to be alive. Now that's going to be hard, isn't it? Because uh, I think the chance is reasonable that actually some are going to die in that time just because of the sheer numbers. But also because the breeding becomes very difficult. You can give attention to one chicken, but you can't give all your attention to 10,000 chickens. And it's like that when you raise moths in captivity. Um, that's why it comes to rare species or expensive species. I prefer to raise a few over raising a thousand of them. Because it, it's, it's better to give them individual attention and care and make sure they grow well than to do mass breedings. So overall, I think the survival ratio is not perfect, but uh, I think it's okay. For some reason, many caterpillars from one of the two sleeves died. Uh, that was odd. I don't know why uh, at some point I opened these two sleeves and, and the caterpillars from one sleeve were almost all gone and the other ones were growing very well. Um, Maybe ants got in there, maybe a predator like a spider or stink bugs, assassin bugs, it can be a lot of things. Uh, if they're outdoors, if you're sleeping, then uh, yeah. Chances are you're going to get predators like birds, you're going to get, to get parasites, you're going to hunt your caterpillars. I mean, out there they are part of the ecosystem. They are protected by the sleeve, but sometimes that protection is just not enough. Um, but there is one thing that's very interesting about my breeding and that was uh, the size of the adults because the moths that I have raised are really really small okay first what I want to show you is uh, I work in a museum so here are the wild polyphemus moths okay this is the size of a normal looking individual here you see wild polyphemus moths and what we see here is one of the specimens that I raised and in comparison, the moths that I have bred are really small, really dwarf almost. Uh, that's really odd. There was one thing that was very strange about my rearing. And that was the size of the moths. Maybe you didn't see it in the video, but some of the moths that I raised were really, really abnormally small. Despite having a good survival ratio, it seems that I have raised almost mini polyphemus moths. Uh, why this is? Well, actually I have a logical explanation for this. Because my sleeving of these moths failed, uh, I had to raise them in a plastic box. I crammed about 50 of them in one small space together. And when you put that many animals in one enclosure, they will compete over food. And all these caterpillars were basically crammed together in one small cage. Caterpillars that have to eat a lot, that have a high biomass, I mean they consumed kilos of leaves every day and the food often ran out. Now, what happens if you, uh, if you give caterpillars too little food? Now, some of you will say, okay, if you don't feed them enough, they will starve. Wrong. Because moths are, and insects in general are really amazing survivalists. So what happens if you starve a caterpillar, so to speak? It, it will actually, sometimes it will not die but it will produce a smaller moth. It will reduce its own size in order to survive. And this is what happened because there was a lot of competition between all the caterpillars. I crammed all of them in one small cage. I raised 50 cocoons in this small tub that I kept changing every day, but the there was still not enough food. 
and most of you most of you already know that I help curate a scientific insect collection and I just took this out of the collection it is a drawer full of uh, polyphemus moths that were collected in the wild why? well I'm going to use them to prove my point okay so here we see some normal healthy polyphemus moths from the wild and here comes my specimen do you see the size difference? Now this is a little bit cherry picked because I chose my smallest specimen to make this comparison. I also had a few that were close to normal size. But the majority was definitely too small. Now you understand what I mean. And that's because too many of them were together in a small space. So there was not enough food for all of them. And because of the lack of food they just became smaller that's really a big difference isn't it now if you want to avoid raising small specimens that are dwarfs like I did but you have to make sure they have plenty food and never run out because caterpillars are used to basically having unlimited food and when they have to compete for it you produce very small moths but uh, overall despite that I think I did well so I'm going to factor in everything that we did before Mm hmm 30% mortality rate yes combined with sleeving didn't work aha I'm going to give myself a 7 out of 10 yes that's right I'm giving myself a rating in this series why just because I like the after talk I am happy with my rearing I did wish that the moths that I bred were, be, were a little bit bigger because uh, it was weird to see all these dwarf moths but the survival ratio was good in my opinion for the amount of individuals that I raised um, I overcame some difficult problems like unexpected sleeving problems I think if I was able to sleeve them I would have had even bigger and more individuals because uh, most losses were on the stage that I put them inside a plastic box because that's just not ideal for this species uh, but overall I gotta say that I did pretty well I captured the entire life cycle um, I succeeded in breeding them um, there's going to be more episodes like this one I'm working on 10 episodes of moth cycles some of which will take one year or more to produce and not all of them have ended in success in fact in one instance there's one moth cycles episode where I end up breeding one moth out of 100 eggs and I'm still going to upload my failures that way so that way it's going to be exciting to see if I fail or not. And in this case, uh, we did have good result. Thank you for watching. This is a small after review. And now we get on to the e-bagging part. Question time! Did you enjoy this video? Do you like this type of content? Would you like to see more videos like this? If the answer to these three questions is yes, then please listen to what I have to say. The video that you just watched was crowdfunded. That means I was only able to make it because of the contributions and donations of the followers who watch this channel. I have a job, so don't get me wrong, I don't need your money to survive. I pay my own bills, I am an adult, but my life is extremely busy. I'm a part-time biology student. I also have a part-time minimum wage job in a warehouse. I work in a museum and I research insects in the tropics. And I'm not telling you this so that you can pity me. Everybody works for their money, including me. I'm not some kind of entitled YouTuber. 
who thinks he should be an exception to this rule. But the truth is, I'm at my current limit. This YouTube channel is permanently demonetized. You see, normal YouTubers, they make money when people watch their videos. But I do not. That means that I have to rely on donations for 100% to run this channel. And the thing is, I just don't have the time and money to make videos like the one that you just watched without anyone that helps me. Now, it may not seem like it, but Moth Cycles, the thing that you just watched, is one of my most ambitious YouTube series so far. These episodes are only 30 to 50 minutes long in viewing time, but the production time is really, really brutal. And uh, they take about half a year to make per episode. This is not a joke. Um, breeding moths is already a lot of work, but specifically breeding them for YouTube, documenting their life cycles, their growth and their progress, and showing you the method that I breed them, showing all the life stages, etc. This uh, takes many hours of filming, patience and hard labor every week over the span of many months time. In fact, the life cycles of some of these moths and butterflies that I show you in this series can take about two to six to 12 months to complete. And this is just very, very hard to do if studies and work swallow up all your free time. So I'm not asking you this because I expect to be paid for making videos that people enjoy. I'm not asking this because I'm some kind of entitled social media person. I'm not asking you because you pity me. In fact, I'm doing quite well. So I'm not asking you this because I expect to be paid just because I make videos that people enjoy. I'm asking you only if you like what you see. If you like what you see and you would like to see more and better content like this. I don't need your money to survive and live my life. I can pay my own bills. I only ask because I needed to make videos that are too expensive for me to make. And to make videos that take time to make. Time that I cannot afford to lose. And I realized that the only way for me to do that is to ask you this question. Even if I know that internet begging can become very obnoxious, especially if I repeat the same question every time. But um, it's the only way for me to make more, uh, to show you better and to improve the quality. It sucks that the world revolves around money. But that's just how it is and I can't change that. YouTube isn't helping me. The only people who are able to help me are my viewers. So consider joining my crowdfunding platform or helping or contributing in another way. Links are below the video. Last but not least, I want to say thank you all for watching. I appreciate all your viewership. I understand that not everybody is willing or able to contribute financially to YouTubers, and that is fine, I completely understand. In fact, I just told you that I am one of the persons that struggles to pay the bills. So hey, I would not either in this position. I get that. So I want to say I appreciate all the people who have helped me where I am right now. And it's gonna be a great year. We're gonna have the best pieces, the rarest ones, the craziest ones. So uh, I think we have a long journey. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Now we have this out of the way, we will move to the last part. I am working on several documentaries. This is not a joke, documentaries of wildlife. I'm working on several more episodes of Moth Cycles, like the one that you just watched today of Andrea Polyphemus. I am filming myself every day while I'm breeding my moths. 
and some of these videos are go take, going to take so long to produce that some of these documentaries will be finished by 2020 or even 2021. The longest video that I'm currently developing will take me two and a half years to make. Two and a half years. And this is absolutely not a joke. This is not bluff. And just to show you that I am not bluffing, I want you to um, end this series in an outro which is called the preview, a teaser trailer, of which I show you some unused images of uh, more episodes that I'm currently developing. So thank you for watching from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for supporting my channel. And to all the people who have donated this year, this episode is here because of you. See you next time.